Hi, I'm Lisa Logan, your host of Parents of Patriots. If you're a parent like me, you probably send your kid to school to gain academic skills that will help them to be successful no matter what avenue they choose in life. Unfortunately, this is no longer the case. Nefarious actors have Marxified and medicalized our schools. I hope by the end of today's video, you'll understand why I entitled it, The Theft of Education. Everyone remembers this scene in Indiana Jones. The prize, resting on a pressure plate, had to be swiftly swapped out for a bag of sand so as not to alert the Guardian's booby traps. The same has happened with education. While parents across the country have been blissfully unaware, the whole purpose of education has been replaced by a bag of something else that starts with an S. How, you ask? Education is now solely about post-secondary readiness and plugging children into the education to workforce pipeline. What it means to be college and career ready has been stolen and replaced by another definition that requires social justice activism. I'll get to that later. And those qualifications require that every aspect of education, including policy, standards, assessments, accountability, you name it, is laser focused on producing students with high emotional intelligence or social emotional skills to participate in a workforce that is enslaved to ESG, which stands for environmental, social, and corporate governance. Corporations have been forced to move from a shareholder capitalism model, where returns or profits to investors is the chief goal of an enterprise, to a stakeholder capitalism model, in which corporations are oriented to serve the interests of all their stakeholders, customers, employees, partners, the community, and society as a whole. In short, corporations are forced to comply with stakeholder demands in regards to the environment, social issues, and governance to bolster their ESG scores or be costed out of business. Key investors and banks won't do businesses with corporations if their ESG score isn't up to snuff. One of the principles of governance to boost ESG has even expanded when it comes to hiring what they call a quote, inclusive workforce, which no longer means just engaging candidates based on affirmative action policies, but also making a point to hire employees based on their emotional intelligence. Forbes notes that hiring decisions that used to be made based on schools attended, grades, and the status of their last employment are shifting to more intangible qualities like high EQ or emotional quotient. Six Seconds, the Emotional Intelligence Network, seems to think that hiring people based on their emotional intelligence is the way to dismantle the systems that contribute to racism. At this point, you may be wondering where all of these changes in education and the workforce are coming from. Just listen to Brian Moynihan, Bank of America's CEO and one of the main advocates behind ESG, explain. Do better to define metrics that meet the sustainable development goals for somebody's used to us reporting our financial metrics. So we got the big four to work together. They took all the metrics that are out there. They consolidated those metrics along the SDG platforms, people, planet, prosperity, principles of governance, four or five metrics in each. Then you, and, and these are metrics people can report on. If you look in our annual report, you can see our report right there. They can sit there and say, these companies are above the bar. The idea here is if you said everybody a company has to be a top, there's only going to be one, and all the money goes to one company. But the idea, if you had 10 companies in the industry and a bar was X, it appears that it's good enough and eight of them are above it, the money will shift away from the other two. And so it'll, it'll self-police itself, even if it doesn't become part of the official metrics, because the investors are now trying to substantiate how they are investing consistent with the SG principles because the people who give them the money want them to do that. Yeah, that's what you all. What everybody forgets about all this is it gets caught up in who's making the decision, but it's their clients telling them you have to do this, and it's our clients telling us you have to do this, especially around the environment and, and becoming more uh, prevalent around the human capital. That's right. ESG metrics are built around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what those are and how they relate to another term Brian Moynihan mentioned, human capital, let me explain. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, are the objectives UN member states agree upon that will guide their efforts and direct their funding for the next 15 years. The current SDGs were renegotiated in 2015, and the UN and its partners are working to accomplish them by 2030. 
Many of the SDGs are noble goals, zero hunger, no poverty, quality education, clean water, etc. But it could be argued that some are being pursued through the globalization and domination of all systems of civilization in the name of global equity. This includes education, which is represented by SDG 4, Quality and Inclusive Education for All, which UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, has put themselves in charge of. You can see the targets here, but the one I want you to notice is target 4.7, Education for Sustainable Development and Global Citizenship. That's why one of UNESCO's stated main goals is Global Citizenship Education, or GCED which they assert is about, quote, empowering learners of all ages to assume active roles, both locally and globally, in building more peaceful, tolerant, inclusive, and secure societies, end quote. Sounds really amazing, right? But a great deal depends on who is defining terms like these and how they are to be measured. In her book, The Invincible Family, Kimberly Ells warns, quote, equitable and inclusive are elastic terms, open to a wide range of interpretations. If deference to equity or equality is required, then young people who embrace the concept of free market systems wherein inequalities are allowed may be tagged as harboring attitudes that are unacceptably inequitable and targeted for re-education. If inclusiveness is applied to matters of sex, then holding specific beliefs about sexual conduct may be assessed as non-inclusive and therefore undesirable. In fact, inclusivity is commonly used to express acceptance of sexual variance. It should be no surprise to you then that UNESCO is one of the prime supporters of comprehensive sexuality education for children, which is far more comprehensive than most people understand, and they partner with the International Planned Parenthood Federation. UNESCO believes that through comprehensive sexuality education, we should be teaching children as young as five about sexual behaviors and children as young as nine about self-stimulation and pleasure. Their efforts as a part of SDG 4 is to get curricula like this into every classroom across the globe. So how does this relate to human capital? Well, human capital is the skills, knowledge, and experience possessed by an individual or population viewed in terms of their value or cost to an organization or country. Essentially, these are the qualities an individual has or doesn't have that are seen as necessary for contributing to societal economic advancement. Governments, civil society, international financial institutions, and the private sector usually join forces to make investments in the areas that help equip every person to achieve their human capital potential. According to the World Bank, quote, investing in people through nutrition, health care, quality education, jobs, and skills helps develop human capital. And this is key to ending extreme poverty and creating more inclusive societies. There's that word again. Including the objective of creating more inclusive societies actually changes the entire definition of human capital from what it historically has been to reflect new priorities for societal advancement. What used to be an individual's qualities that contribute to society as a whole has now become the qualities they possess that contribute to what is envisioned as the correct version of collective society touted by investors like the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, and others pushing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This horrific paper by Ben Williamson examines how human capital formation has now become an international policy focus as governments seek to intervene in personalities by measuring their socio-emotional indicators to predict socio-economic outcomes. The 26-page paper then goes on to describe the huge infrastructure of support for this endeavor that's been set up through think tank coalitions, philanthropies, software companies, investment schemes, and international organizations helped along by the advocacy of psychologists, economists, and behavioral scientists. This chart I made tells you some of the players involved, and the ones in bold are mentioned in the paper. The political rationality for governments to collect this sensitive data is that they can effectively measure society and effectively or emotionally manage their subjects, your children, through psychological intervention. Your alarm bell should be definitely going off right about now. Hence, the whole purpose of social-emotional learning taught in schools is to, quote, seek statistical data on the human psychological characteristics and emotional intelligence that are acquired by labor markets to maximize the productivity potential of new computer-based automated systems and artificial intelligence. Did you hear anything in that sentence about helping our kids manage their emotions or the emotions of others or building healthy relationships that proponents claim is the purpose of SEL? Hmm, 
neither did I. Investors view the building of an infrastructure of social-emotional measurement in education as vital to the social-emotional management of the future digital economy. Being able to measure and track social-emotional skills is seen as essential to developing characteristics, personalities, and behaviors required to preserve human capital in an AI-dominated future, where they believe work will require pairing computer intelligence with humans' appropriate SEL skills. In other words, they need to shift the whole target and task of education policy and governance to gathering this psychodata through SEL assessments as evidence of whether or not their, quote, shaping of children's personalities to achieve economic ends, end quote, is working. What is the aim of these economic ends, you ask? Oh, yes, achieving the sustainable development goals, of course. This publication by UNESCO talks about how students' natural inclination to preserve the self sometimes interferes with them wanting to value the collective's goals of what it might take and what might have to be sacrificed in order to attain the UN SDGs. As such, they plan to use SEL as a tool through this very twisted interpretation of Einstein's E equals MC squared equation to manipulate children's minds using empathy, compassion, and getting children to have a critical consciousness through perspective taking to overcome the cognitive dissonance that these conflicting values create. They say, quote, recent experiences with SEL in schools show promise in improving pro-social behavior and inculcate actions that go beyond just the self but toward the collective good. This, however, suggests a radical change in our education systems, end quote. They weren't kidding. The imperative to teach, measure, and track social-emotional learning is literally coming from every facet of the education system. Many of them are listed here, though this is not a comprehensive list. To understand the state's shift to measuring and reporting on non-academic factors, you have to understand how the U.S. Department of Ed directs education in the states using a federal tripod of policies, which consists of standards, assessments, and accountability. Laws like the 1994 Improving America's Schools Act crack the door for states accepting federal money, like Title I funds, to be held accountable to the federal government for their results. And laws like No Child Left Behind and ESSA blew it wide open. Here you can see the fundamental shifts this made in who decides what students should learn, how that learning is measured through assessments, and what states are required to report back to the federal government on. All of this led to more federal control of education and in turn less local control. We went from states making their own standards to the federal government dictating what educational standards should be through initiatives like Common Core. States accepting federal money are then subjected to federal accountability, having not only to report on students' mastery of academic skills, but also non-academic skills. What you must report on, you must assess. So assessments were changed to measure academic skills as well as social-emotional skills. What you assess, you must teach. So curriculum now included instruction on social-emotional skills, which was embedded into curriculum to meet common core standards. How student progress was measured had to shift from being qualitative to quantitative. Outcomes had to be concretely measurable as a number and tracked over time, with the ability for it to follow the child, like a digital data backpack, not just through their educational career, but across schools and state lines. In order to achieve this, statewide longitudinal data systems that were built to house all the data being collected were expanded into interoperable data systems that were able to communicate across state lines. All of the aforementioned changes gave rise to digital learning and assessment tools that gave big tech and big data more control over what kids are learning, how it's being measured, and the massive amounts of information, especially psychodata, being collected on students. The aforementioned globalists in Williamson's paper want to use this federal tripod of control to measure children to make sure they're adopting the appropriate social-emotional skills that will pair with computerized intelligence in the future economy and, of course, garner their support of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. How would they ensure their vision becomes a reality? A social credit system. There would need to be a human capital system in place or an SEL to ESG pipeline which shifts the purpose of education to emphasizing teaching, measuring, and tracking the social-emotional skills that employers want candidates to have. There would have to be a concentration of power, in this case a monopoly of business and education, then eventually all systems of society, through public-private partnerships. This requires a decentralized, mostly digital model of education so that big tech and big data have unfettered influence over what students are learning and how it's measured. 
the eventual goal would be for the measured skills and competencies or virtual education credentials gathered through digital learning to be stored in a digital credentials wallet using the same blockchain technology behind digital currency. A full digital identification will follow that will store your driver's license, health information, deed to your house or car, banking information, etc. Just like China's social credit system, this digital ID and what's stored in it could be used as a reward or punishment system based on compliance to societal rules. Impossible, you say? Think again. Many of these structures are already in place. Most states are already measuring and tracking students' social-emotional skills through assessments like those offered through the tech company Panorama Education. These are the social-emotional skills Panorama can assess in individual students, on the class or school as a whole, and in curated groups. Panorama quantifies and measures the following about your kids. Self-efficacy, grit, self-management, social awareness, sense of belonging, and classroom effort, which includes emotional regulation, engagement, learning strategies, and social perspective taking. Listen to them explain their product. With Panorama, you can start by measuring students' social emotional learning skills and supports with research backed surveys and assessments. It's easy to customize a survey that meets your district's needs, as you can choose from over 22 topics like growth mindset, social awareness, and self management, or any of the topics that align to the CASEL framework. The survey will take students about 10 to 15 minutes to complete, and teachers and staff can also rate their students' skills right from within Panorama. Once the data is collected, get immediate insight into student voice, what students are thinking, and how they feel about their skills, habits, and mindsets. See how each score compares to Panorama's national benchmarks. Then dig deeper to explore each topic in more detail like how it's changed over time, or any gaps between student groups, and how students responded to each question individually. Then, identify individual students' strengths and opportunities for growth by filtering student-level SEL results to create smart groups, which will update as new SEL surveys are run over time, allowing you to add specific students to a group for more targeted intervention and progress monitoring. And best of all, our team is always here to help with professional development, training, and support. That's why Panorama is used by thousands of schools and districts across the country. Get in touch with our team to learn how to start using Panorama today. So Panorama surveys can measure any topic that aligns with CASEL's framework and can identify students for growth opportunities and targeted intervention. Hmm. If students are asked, for instance, in this Panorama survey, how often they spend time with people at school who are a different race, ethnicity, or culture than them, and they answer almost never, will this count against their score in social perspective taking? I'd like to know. If a student answers almost never to the question, how well does your school speak out against racism, will the DOJ get involved and take over your school district like what happened in Davis County, Utah? What does targeted intervention look like? Probably even more thought reform education in social emotional skills offered through programs like Second Step, which is owned by Committee for Children. Second Step is one of the most widely used programs in the nation, reaching 20 and a half million children per year, kindergarten through eighth grade. My foray into becoming an education whistleblower actually began last year when this particular program was slated to be taught at my child's school. Being a curious person who likes to investigate things, another parent and I did a deep dive into what it was teaching, and what we found was deeply concerning. Second step cited power and privilege, which are tenets of critical race theory, as one of the three main social factors for bullying. In general, race is a primary factor second step focuses their bullying lessons on. We then proceed to primarily show white people in the role of the aggressor and people of color in the role of the victim throughout the lessons to cement the association that white people have the most power and privilege. The program focuses heavily on social justice activism, particularly for gay and transgender students. In this slide, children are instructed to choose a disruption strategy, which promotes anarchy while using the raised fist symbolism of black power and BLM to convey that message. 
This is an example of how the program would covertly try to slip in suggestive ideas, like in this sixth grade lesson, where one of the examples of specific goals they could make was to, quote, work for a social justice organization, slipped ever so subtly between graduate from high school and learn one new dance routine this month. I don't know about you, but when I was 11, working for a social justice organization was nowhere on my radar. In seventh grade, Second Step introduces the idea of consent, a common theme of comprehensive sexuality education, by stating that the difference between sexual harassment and flirting is whether words or actions were welcome or not. Students were asked to classify whether or not being shown pictures of a sexual nature at school was sexual harassment or flirting. And the message wasn't that it was always wrong for someone to do that, but the category it fell in was determined by if it bothered you. The final and most egregious thing we found was that there were two third-party links recommended to 7th and 8th graders that violated Utah sex education laws. The links loveisrespect.org and rain.org violated parental consent, and if followed, would have exposed 12 and 13-year-olds to inappropriate sexual content. Those websites led them to other websites like Scarletine, where they could learn how to have a safe, self-managed medical abortion, and it also linked to Planned Parenthood. Second Step has a whole page on their website dedicated to anti-racial and anti-bias resources filled with links espousing the tenets of critical race theory. And they even state in that top paragraph that they subscribe to Castle's new definition of transformative SEL, which shifted in 2020. Who is Castle? Castle stands for the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, and they're the organization that sets the five core competencies or standards by which all SEL programs are measured against. In fact, many states won't even implement SEL programs that aren't CASEL approved. As you can see here, the social-emotional competencies students are expected to learn have changed. This is a problem because these new competencies and definition of transformative SEL reflect their Marxian beliefs that the United States is systemically racist and was founded on racialized oppression. Interestingly enough, CASEL serves on the Global Steering Committee for Karanga's Global Alliance for SEL, with representatives from UNESCO and Committee for Children. All three of these entities view SEL as a way to manipulate the teaching of what it means to have empathy and take others' perspectives in order to radicalize students into social justice activists for particular causes and ideologies. This is especially problematic because CASEL has convinced many states, in fact 40, to become a part of their CASEL Collaborating States Initiative. In it, states align education and workforce policy through an SEL lens. Students will be able to be indoctrinated with social-emotional learning as early as preschool, all under the guise of teaching kids to prepare for post-secondary readiness as a part of a career and workforce development program. My own state of Utah is a part of this Education to Workforce Pathways project, so our State Board of Education has agreed to embed social-emotional learning everywhere in education in order to teach the social-emotional skills that business and industry partners deem the correct ones. These are the same business and industry partners enslaved to ESG. This push to emphasize social-emotional skills over academic ones in the path to college and career readiness is reflected in Utah's portrait of a graduate which lists the 13 competencies students should leave the Utah K-12 system with. Many states have adopted the Portrait of a Graduate Framework, which is actually a national program from a Gates-funded company called Battelle for Kids. Battelle's strategic partners that direct states' adoption of Portrait of a Graduate are Castle, Aurora Institute, ExcelNED, and KnowledgeWorks, all Gates-funded organizations. KnowledgeWorks is also behind Utah's current shift in our school accountability model away from traditional merit-based grading and into what is called Personalized Competency-Based Learning, or PCBL. Both Portrait of a Graduate and PCBL shift the focus of education away from being mostly academic and learned in a classroom to being largely based around social-emotional competencies with learning happening anytime, anywhere. KnowledgeWorks wholeheartedly supports this radical transformation in school accountability because they believe that tracking student progress through merit-based grading is actually racist and a tool of the colonizer. They view personalized competency-based learning and education built around social-emotional skills or emotional intelligence as a stepping stone toward liberatory education. If you don't know what that is, think of it this way. Just as social-emotional learning was embedded into Common Core academic standards and subjects and assessments, liberatory education will infuse critical theory into everything. Doesn't that sound nice? Being future education forecasters, 
KnowledgeWorks has gamed out different scenarios on what learning will look like in the future. One of the four projected scenarios KnowledgeWorks paints is a picture where there is low responsiveness to systems change in both public institutions and society, so families flee the public education system for micro schools teaching liberatory education. Some micro schools, fueled and funded by school choice initiatives, have already made themselves the testing ground for this liberatory education model. School choice programs, like the Koch and Walton Family Foundation funded Four Pono Schools, which launched with the School Choice Initiative Yes, Every Kid, are built toward that end. Here, Four Pono Schools explains that their Angel Syndicate is a six-month program and giving circle for black leaders looking to build collective power as education philanthropists. They say this is needed because philanthropy is just too white, and they want to build a new model to shift power away from that to make things more equitable. Just read 4.0's Playbook 1 on Power, and you'll see that their goal through school choice initiatives is the decentralization and eventual dismantling of the public education system while transferring power and control to themselves. They fund projects like Woke Kindergarten. Rainbow Baby by Key. Yellow. Can you find the color yellow? Purple. Can you find the color purple? Red. Can you find the color red? Orange. Can you find the color orange? Brown. Can you find the color brown? Pink. Can you find the color pink? Green. Can you find the color green? Blue. Can you find the color blue? Black. Can you find the color black? Rainbow. Can you find all the colors of the rainbow? Considering the same money streams funding what we think of as good school choice are also funding grant makers like 4.0 schools, how do we know that all education isn't going to end up like woke kindergarten? Especially considering folks like ASU and Global Silicon Valley are behind this movement. In 2012, Global Silicon Valley advisors put out a document called American Revolution 2.0, in which they laid out their strategic battle plan for the next 15 years. Notice that many of the things on this list have already happened. Common Core, No Child Left Behind 2.0, which was the Every Student Succeeds Act passed in 2015, Universal Tablets, etc. Also note, at the 10-year mark, they want to do away with locally elected school boards with the eventual goal of having an open online campus. If we don't have any elected representation in education, who do you think is going to be running the show? Don't worry, they have a plan for that. It's called the Internet of Education, and according to these slides I discovered in my research, these public-private partnerships are the ones that will get to decide what your kids learn, how it's measured, and how that information gets disseminated to other systems that will be attached to this network. As you will see in this video from Institute for the Future, Educational competencies will be earned and exchanged through those networks, like currency, using blockchain technology. Your ledger account tracks everything you ever learn in units called EduBlocks. Each EduBlock represents one hour of learning in a particular subject. Anyone can grant EduBlocks to anyone else. You can earn EduBlocks from a formal institution like a school or your workplace. But you can also earn them from individuals or informal groups like a community center or an app. The ledger makes it possible for you to get credit for learning that happens anywhere, even when you're just doing the things you love. Your profile displays all the EduBlocks you've earned. Employers can use this information to offer you a job or a gig that matches your skills. We'll keep track of all the income your skills generate and use that data to provide feedback on your courses. When choosing a subject to study in the future, you may wish to choose the subject whose students are earning the most income. You can also use the ledger to find investors in your education. Since the ledger is already tracking income earned from each EduBlock, you can offer investors a percentage of your future income in exchange for free learning hours. 
Our smart contracts make these agreements easy to manage and administer. The ledger is built on blockchain, the same technology that powers Bitcoin and other digital currencies. That means every edgy block that has ever been earned is a permanent part of the growing public record of our collective learning and working. Who's behind the Internet of Education? Let's look. Some of the allies listed are the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who facilitate the education to career pipeline. Well, that's great. UNESCO, who you know wants all children to learn the same thing so they can see their sustainable development goals come to fruition. Oh, and Walmart, a huge funder of 4.0 schools and of the school choice movement pushing ESA and voucher bills. What is going to keep the school choice movement from turning into the Walmart of education, where these public-private partnerships crowd out other options so they have a monopoly and essentially eliminate all of our choices? Especially since UNESCO, in their latest Global Education Monitoring Report and corresponding papers, have clearly stated that they want to use the accountability mechanisms of public funding going into private education through ESA and voucher bills as a way to regulate non-state schools and ensure that all education aligns with the government's equity goals. The authors say that PPPs are not, quote, exempt from complying with centrally defined curriculums, learning standards, or student admissions criteria, among other public regulations. Accountability frameworks play a strategic role in promoting that all public-funded schools, independently of their ownership, are correctly aligned with quality standards and also with the equity goals and objectives set by the government. Hmm. Sounds like they're trying to get all schools to be a part of a single system so they can have global citizenship education, right? Don't take my word for it. Just listen to the chair of the Global Education Monitoring Report say so himself. The 2021-2022 Global Education Monitoring Report's rallying call, Who Chooses? Who Loses? invites policymakers to question relationships with non-state actors in terms of fundamental choices and their trade-offs between equity and freedom of choice, two pillars of the right to education, between encouraging initiative and setting standards, between groups of varying means and needs, between immediate commitments under SDG 4 and those to be progressively realized. It calls for governments to see all institutions, students and teachers as part of a single system, to use common quality standards, common monitoring and support processes for all providers. Governance systems can be complex when multiple actors are involved. This makes oversight that much more important. The report warns that inequality and exclusion can also result if private education is not effectively regulated. The report's peer website will help inform our policy dialogue on this issue. It tracks and compares non-state provision regulations in 211 countries around the world. This report reads my mind when it calls on governments to create spaces to foster initiative and to set the conditions for a variety of actors to interact, coordinate, and cooperate. Some people say that non-state actors should not play a role in education. This report shows that in fact, they already do today and will continue to do so tomorrow. And it is our responsibilities to hashtag write the rules. I encourage you to read the 2021-2022 GEM report recommendations and the vision it has for change. In case it passed by too quickly in the video, this is a clip from UNESCO's peer website where they outline that their vision for regulating non-state actors in the United States will be through ESA and voucher legislation. Notice that they specifically mention the quote, fund students not systems rhetoric of the school choice proponents that are pushing these bills. It makes me question why American Federation for Children would pick someone who is an expert for UNESCO's Inclusive Policy Lab as the face and voice of this movement. Why is this their vision? Because many of these bills, as a part of their accountability mechanisms, require students to take normative assessments as a condition of taking the money. 
Not to mention that state boards of education, like mine in Utah, have the power to govern, and often do so, through the Administrative Rulemaking Act. Since they're in charge of the scholarship granting organization, they can tighten the noose of regulations at any time they want. This highlighted, nice-sounding, protective language actually has required assessments and a federal anti-discrimination law hidden under the accept clauses that will make it possible for the governments to worm their way into the practices of homeschool and private schools. Remember, they need all of society. These bills don't fix the problem of the federal tripod of control or the fact that in most states, their state constitutions grant the State Board of Education with, quote, general control and supervision of public education. Public education encompasses anything that uses public money to fund it, including ESAs and vouchers, which is why lawsuits are occurring in states that pass this legislation. Private education options will probably unfortunately find out, as did charter schools when they came on the scene, that any amount of public funding means that the autonomy they were hoping for can be legally usurped. The 2001 USBA, or Charter School Board Association, versus Utah State Board of Education case is a cautionary tale as the Utah Supreme Court ruled that our State Board of Ed has plenary power over public education and could tell the charter schools what to do. In reality, education is just the low-hanging fruit in the effort to monopolize all systems of society and make blockchain technology the preferred method of information gathering and sharing. This is another slide from the Internet of Education slide deck, a convenient digital credentials wallet like that shown here where students can store their competencies or skills to give to colleges or employers is an easy sell as the first step toward moving all personal information over to a digital ID. These credentials will be the decentralized data gathered from digital learning and assessing facilitated by personalized competency-based learning and school choice, all focused on their social, emotional, or employability skills. I shudder to think how any of this information could be misused by government in a social credit system where you're expected to think and act in alignment with the government or with the sustainable development goals, especially after watching the discrimination of individuals who didn't get the shot during the pandemic. Will people be able to get their election privileges or ability to get a loan or buy a house taken away? Will it be harder for students to get a job or participate in society if they don't adopt the correct mindsets or do what the government or businesses want them to? I hate to tell you that this is beginning to happen already. How? Well, what is expected of students to be college and career ready from both a school counselor's perspective and a business perspective has been fundamentally changed. The National Association of Colleges and Employers 2021 list of eight career readiness competencies created by a task force of representatives from both higher education and corporations lay out the characteristics employers are desiring the most. Note that one of the competencies, equity and inclusion, requires engagement in, quote, anti-racist practices that actively engage the systems, structures, and policies of racism, end quote. Considering university relations and recruiting professionals are being encouraged to use these NACE career readiness competencies in their recruiting and professional development efforts, it begs the following questions. Will a student not be considered career ready then if they don't believe in the Marxian critical race theory tenet of systemic racism? Are prospective candidates not employable if they haven't demonstrated their activism by attempting to tear down the systems of society which critical race theorists believe are set up to intentionally oppress people of color? More importantly, how does the influence of these competencies trickle down into the role of school counselors and consequently the K-12 classrooms of youth across the nation as they prepare them for post-secondary readiness? You have to look no further than ASCA, the American School Counselors Association, for the answer to that question. ASCA's student standards, which describe the knowledge, attitudes, and skills students should be able to demonstrate as a result of a school counseling program, was revised in 2021. This revision was informed by the 2018 Social Justice Standards from Teaching for Tolerance, Now Learning for Justice, Anti-Bias Framework, which has been crosswalked with the ASCA Student Mindsets and Behavior Standards. As such, additional language to the existing standards and added standards reflects the new Marxist-derived social justice activist mindsets and behaviors students are expected to have in order to be college and career ready. To track student progress in the acquisition of skills, school counselors write or select measurable learning objectives that align with specific mindsets and behaviors from the above codes. And those learning objectives directly reflect the school counseling program's vision, mission, and goals, as well as the school's academic vision. 
Concurrently, student growth toward those objectives is gathered through assessments that collect data on their mindsets and behaviors. It makes sense then why there has been an influx of curricula that is racially charged, including tier one or whole school intervention materials like social emotional learning programs based on Castle's new definition of transformative SEL, as well as SEL measuring and tracking tools like those provided by Panorama Education. All children are now at risk and in danger of not graduating with the correct mindsets and behaviors. Students are expected to adopt those beliefs and become activists who are doing the work to dismantle the systems of oppression because if they don't, they won't possess the employability skills that qualify them to be college and career ready. The day is soon approaching, if not already here, when graduates who gave their all to earn excellent grades and test scores will be confused about their lack of opportunity in higher education and beyond. Unbeknownst to them and their bewildered parents, it will be because their transcript didn't say that they scored well in social justice. This at-risk status is also being used as a justification to medicalize our schools, turning them into community hubs using Title I funding. Schools can also apply for a partial hospitalization license to be able to bill for these intervention services through Medicaid using DSM codes for, quote, mental health wraparound services. DSM codes contains descriptions, symptoms, and other criteria for diagnosing mental disorders. These codes, or justification for using Medicaid for these interventions, are stored in students' records in the statewide longitudinal data system. What DSM codes have been applied to your child if they're not adopting the correct mindsets and behaviors? On top of that, the CDC, WHO, and others want to use the medicalization of schools through SEL to eventually make schools into full service providers that offer much more than mental health through their WISC or whole school, whole community, whole child model. These are the 10 domains of health that they want schools to emphasize and handle, and this will include sexual and reproductive health. This will provide the justification for UNESCO's dream of having comprehensive sexuality education in every school and children having easy access to a Planned Parenthood clinic on campus. Think I'm being hyperbolic? The WISC implementation has already made this a reality for high schools in California. Not only is this the theft of education, but the takeover of the role of parents in their children's lives. The education reforms of systemic social emotional learning, business reforms of ESGs, the push for backpack funding school choice bills, and finance reforms toward digital blockchain type currency are all linked and part of a larger global agenda of social behaviorism and a top-down, bottom-up control of all aspects of human life. Like in China, government and public-private partnerships will control knowledge, jobs, and financial stability, and more, forcing citizens to think and behave according to their moral objectives, or else. If these reforms aren't stopped in their tracks, the social credit system threatening to take over society in the United States will soon become a reality. Our dear children are more than mere cogs in the wheel of the global economy. Our children deserve real choice and autonomy preserved for generations to come. To get out of this debacle that we're in, we need long-term solutions, not government handouts and illusions of choice that will eventually take away every choice. We need to come up with creative ways within our own communities to offer support for families who want more educational options but don't have the means to do so. We honestly need to start working through the steps to dismantle the DOE and return local control to education or create a parallel system of both education and the workforce that is free from the mandates of SEL and ESG. If you have any more ideas, please put them in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post new content. Thank you for joining me as we keep up the fight for the future of our kids.